Chapter 24 Still well! Madeline's cry was more than the utterance of a breaking heart. It was full of agony. But also, it uttered the shattering of a structure built of false pride, of old belief, of bloodless standards, of ignorance of self. It betrayed the final conquest of her doubts, and out of their darkness blazed the unquenchable spirit of a woman who had found herself, her love, her salvation, her duty to a man, and who would never be cheated. The old cattleman stood mute before her, staring at her white face, at her eyes of flame. Stillwell, I'm Stuart's wife. My God, Miss Majesty, he burst out. Well, I knowed something terrible was wrong. Oh, sure, it's a pity. Do you think I'd let him be shot when I know him now? When I'm no longer blind when I love him? She asked with a passionate swiftness. I'll save him. This is Wednesday morning. I have 36 hours to save his life. Still well? Send for Link in the car. She went into her office. Her mind worked with extraordinary rapidity and clariness. Her plan, born in one lightning-like flash of a thought, necessitated the careful wording of telegrams to Washington, to New York, to San Antonio. These were to senators, representatives, men in high and public, in private life, men who would remember her and who would serve her to their utmost. Never before had her position meant anything to her comparable to what it meant now. Never in all of her life had money seemed the power that it was then, if she had been poor. A shuddering chill froze the thought in its interception. She dispelled the heartbreaking thoughts. She had power. She had wealth. She would set into operation all the unlimited means these gave her. The wires and the pulleys, strings underneath the surface of political and international life, the open, free, purchasing value of money, or the deep, underground, mysterious, powerful influence moved by gold. She could save Stuart. She must await results, deadlocked in feeling, strained perhaps beyond endurance, because the suspense would be great. But she would allow no possibility of failure to enter her mind. When she went outside, the car was there with Link, helmet in hand, a cool, bright gleam in his eyes, and with Stillwell, losing his haggard misery, began to respond to Madeline's spirit. Link? Drive Stillwell to El Cajon in time for him to catch the El Paso train. Wait for him there, and if any message comes from him, telephone it to me at once. Then she gave Stillwell the telegrams to send from El Cajon and drafts to cash in El Paso. She instructed him to go before the rebel Yonat, and then station at Juarez to explain the situation to bid them expect communications from Washington officials requesting and advising Stuart's exchange as a prisoner of war to offer to buy his release from the rebel authorities. When Stillwell had heard her through, his huge, bowed form straightened. A ghost of his old smile just moved to his lips. He was no longer young, and hope could not at once be driven away the stern and grim realities. As he bent over her hand, his manner appeared courtly and reverent. But either he was speechless, or felt the moment not one for him to break the silence. He climbed to the seat beside Link, who pocketed the watch he'd been studying, and leaned over the wheel. There was a crack. A muffling sound burst into a roar, and the huge car jerked forward to bound over the edge of the slope, to leap down the long incline, and shoot out upon the level valley floor and disappear in moving dust. For the first time in days, Madeline visited the gardens, the corrals, the lakes, and the quarters of the cowboys. Though imagining she was calm, she feared she looked strange to Nell's, to Nick, 
to Frankie Slade to those boys who were best known to her. The situation for them must have been one of tormenting pain and bewilderment. They acted as if they wanted to say something to her, but found themselves spellbound. She wondered, do they know that she was Stuart's wife? Stillwell had not had time to tell them, besides, he would not have mentioned the fact. These cowboys only knew that Stuart was sentenced to be shot. They knew if Madeline had not been angry with them, he would not have gone in a desperate fight and moon across the border. She spoke of the weather, of the horses and cattle, asked Nels when he was to go on duty, and turned away from the wide, sunlit adobe porch where the cowboys stood silent and bareheaded. And then one of her subtle impulses checked her. Nels, you and Nick need not go on duty today. I may want you. I... She hesitated, paused, and stood lingering there. Her glance had fallen upon Stuart's big black horse that pranced in a nearby corral. I've sent Stillwell to El Paso, she went on in a low voice that she failed to hold steady. He will save Stuart. I have to tell you, I'm Stuart's wife. She felt the stricken amazement that made these men silent and immovable. With level gaze averted, she left them. Returning to the house and to her room, she prepared for something. For what? To wait. And then a great invisible shadow seemed to hoover over her. She essayed many tasks, to fail of attention, to find her mind held only Stuart and his fortunes. Why had he become a federal? She reflected that he had won his title, El Capitan, fighting for Mandro the rebel. But Mandro was now a federal, and Stuart was true to him. In crossing the border, had Stuart had any other motive than one he implied to Madeline in his mocking smile and scorning words? You might have saved me a lot of trouble. What trouble? She felt again the cold shock of contact with the gun that she had dropped in horror. He meant the trouble of getting self shot, in the only way a man could seek death without cowardice. But had he any other motives? She recalled Don Carlos and his guerrillas. Then the thought leapt in her mind with the gripping power that Stuart meant to hunt down Don Carlos to meet him and kill him. It would be the deed of a silent, vengeful man placed by wild justice such as been the deadly leavens of Monty Price. It was a deed to expect of Nels or Nick Steele and of Jean Stewart. Madeline felt regret that Stewart, as he had climbed so high, had not risen above deliberately seeking to kill his enemy, however evil that enemy may be. The local papers, which came regularly a day late from El Paso and Douglas, had not won any particular interest from Madeline, and now, however, she took up any copy she could find and read all the information pertaining to the revolution. Every word seemed to be vital to her, of holding significant force. The paper read, Americans robbed by Mexican rebels. Mandara, state of Chihuahua, Mexico, July 17. Have looted the Mandara Lumber Company storehouses of $25,000 worth of goods and robbed scores of foreigners of horses and saddles. The rebel command of General Ontario Riaz comprises of a thousand men. It started westward today through the state of Sonora, the troops are heading for Dolores, where a mountain pass leads into the state of Sonora. Their entrance will be opposed by a thousand volunteers who are reported to be waiting the rebel invasion. The railroad south of Mandra has been destroyed and many Americans who have traveled from Chihuahua, from Yorez, are marooned there. General Roe has executed five men while here for alleged offenses of trivial character. 
Next column. Washington, July 17. Somewhere in Mexico, Patrick Duane, an American citizen, is in prison under sentence of death. This much and no more the State Department learned through Representative Kilken of Nebraska. Consultation officers in various sections of Mexico have been directed to make every effort to locate Duane and save his life. Next column. Juarez, Mexico. July 17th. General Ortez, chief of the rebels, declared today, If the United States will throw down the barriers and let us have all the ammunitions we can buy, I promise in 60 days to have peace restored in Mexico and a stable government in charge. Madeline read on in feverish absorption. It was not a real war, but a starving, robbing, burning, hopeless revolution. Five men executed for alleged offenses of trivial nature. What chances had then a federal prisoner, an enemy to be feared, an American cowboy in the clutches of those crazed rebels? Madeline endured patiently, endured for long hours, while holding to her hope with a will. No message came. At sunset, she went outdoors, suffering a torrent of accumulating suspense. She faced the desert, hoping and praying for strength, and the desert did not influence her, as did the passionless, unchangeable stars that had soothed her spirit. It was red, mutable, shrouded in shadows terrible like her mood. A dust-veiled sunset colored the vast, brooding, naked wastes of rock and sand, the grim Chiquala frowned black and sinister. The dim blue domes of the Guadalupes seemed to whisper, to beckon to her. Beyond them, somewhere was Stuart, awaiting the end of a possible brief hour, hours that to her were boundless and endless. Night fell, but now the white, pitiless stars, they failed her. Then she sought the seclusion and darkness of her room, only to lay there with wide eyes, waiting, waiting. She had always been susceptible to somber, mystical unrealities of night, and now her mind slowly revolved round a vague and monstrous gloom. Nevertheless, she was acutely sensitive to outside impressions. She heard the measured tread of a guard, the rustling of wind stirring the window curtain, the remote, mournful wail of a coyote. By and by, the dead silence of night insulated her with laden oppression. There were silent darknesses for so long that when the window casement showed gray, she believed it was only fancy and that dawn would never come. She prayed for the sun not to rise, not to begin its short twelve-hour journey toward what might be a fatal setting of Stuart. But the dawn did lighten. Swiftly, she thought, remorselessly. Daylight was broken, and this was Thursday. Sharp ringing of the telephone bell startled her, roused her into action, and she ran to answer the call. Hello, hello, Miss Majesty, came the hurried reply. This is Linka talking. I got messages for you. Favorable, the operator said. I'm to ride out with them. I'll be coming a humming. That was all. Madeline heard the pang of the re receiver as Stevens threw it down. She passionately wanted to know more, but was immeasurably grateful for so much. Favorable. Then Stillwell had been successful. Her heart leaped. Suddenly, she became weak, and her hands failed of their accustomed morning daftness. It took her what seemed a thousand years to get dressed. Morning breakfast meant nothing to her except it helped her to pass dragging by minutes. Finally, a low hum, mounting swiftly to a roar, and ended with a sharp report, announcing the arrival of the car. If her feet had kept pace with her heart, she would have raced out to meet Link. She saw him, helmet thrown back, watch in hand, and he looked up at her with his cool, bright smile. 
with his familiar, apologetic manner. Fifty-three minutes, Miss Majesty. But I had to go around a herd of steers and bump a couple off the trail. He gave her a packet of telegrams. Madeline tore them open with shaking fingers and began to read with swift, dimming eyes. Some were from Washington, assuring her of every possible service. Some from New York. Others written in Spanish were from El Paso, and these she could not wholly translate at a brief glance. Would she never find Stillwell's message? It was the last. It was lengthy, and it read, Bought Stuart's release. Also arranged for his transfer as prisoner of war. Both matters are official. He's safe if we can get notice to his captors. Not sure I've reached them by wire. Afraid to trust it. You go with Link to Agua Prieta. Take the messages sent you in Spanish. They will protect you and secure Stuart's freedom. Take Nels with you. Stop for nothing. Tell Link all. Trust him. Let him drive that car. Signed, Stillwell. The first few lines of Stillwell's message lifted Madeline to the heights of thanksgiving and happiness. And then, reading on, she experienced a check, a numb, icy, sickening pang. At the last line, she flung off doubt and dread, and in white, cold passion faced the issue. Read this, she said briefly, handing the telegram to Link. He scanned it, and then looked blankly up at her. Link, do you know the roads, the trails, the desert between here and Agua Prieta? She asked. That's sure my old stomping grounds, and I know Sonora, too. We must reach Agua Prieta before our sunset. Long before. So if Stuart is in some nearby camp, we can get to it in time. Miss Majesty, it's, it's not possible. Stillwell's crazy to say that. Link, can an automobile be driven out here into northern Mexico? Sure, but it would take some time. We must do it in little time. Otherwise, Stuart probably will be shot. Link Stevens appeared suddenly to grow lax and shriveled, to lose all of his pertinent brightness to weaken in age. I'm only a cowboy, Miss Majesty. He only almost faltered. It was a singular change in him. That's an awful ride down over the border. If... By some luck, I didn't smash the car. I'd turn your hair gray. You'd never be no good after that ride. I'm Stuart's wife, she answered him, and she looked at him, not conscious of any motion to persuade or allure, but to let him know the greatness of her dependence upon him. He started violently. The old action of Stuart, the momentary action of Monty Price, this man was of the same wild breed. And then Madeline's words flowed in a torrent. I'm Stuart's wife, and I love him. I've been unjust to him, and I must save him. Link, I have faith in you. I beseech that you do your best for Stuart's sake, for my sake. I'll risk the ride gladly and bravely. I'll not care how or where you drive. I'd rather plunge into a canyon and go to my death upon the rocks and not try and save him. How beautiful the response of this rude cowboy. To realize his absolute unconsciousness of self, to see the haggard shade bore out on his face, the old cool devil-may-care spirit returned to his eyes, and to feel something wonderful about him then. It was more than will or daring or sacrifice, a blood tie might have existed between him and Madeline. She sensed again that brother-like quality, so fine, almost invisible, which seemed to inalienate trait in all these wild cowboys. Miss Majesty, 
That ride figures impossible, but I'll do her. He replied. His cool, bright glance thrilled her. I'll need maybe half an hour to go over that car and to pack on what I'll want. She could not thank him, and her replies were merely a request that he tell Nels and other cowboys off duty to come up to the house. When Link had gone, Madeline gave a moment's thought to preparation for the ride. She placed what money she had in the telegrams in a satchel. The gown she had on was thin and white, not suitable at all for travel, but she would not be risking losing of one moment in changing it. She put on a long coat and wound veils round about her head and neck, arranged them in a hood so that she could cover her face when necessary. She remembered to take an extra pair of goggles for Nell's use, and then, drawing on her gloves, she went out ready for the ride. The number of cowboys were waiting. She explained the situation and left them in charge of her home. With that, she asked Nels to accompany her down into the desert. He turned white in his lips, and this occasioned Madeline to remember his mortal dread of the car and Link's driving. Nels, I'm sorry to ask you. I know how you hate that car, but I need you. I, I need you much. Why, Miss Majesty, that sure all of a mistaken idea of yours about me hating that car, he said in a slow, soft drawl. I was only jealous of Link, and the boys, they, they made that joke up on me about being scared of riding fast. Sure, I'm, I'm powerful proud to go, and I reckon if you hadn't asked me, my feelings might have been some hurt, because if you're going to be going down among them greasers, you want me with you. His cool, easy speech, his familiar swagger, the smile with which he regarded her did not at least deceive Madeline. The gray was still in his face, incomprehensible as it seemed. Nels had a dread, an uncanny fear, and it was of that huge white automobile. But he lied about it. Here again was that strange quality of faithfulness. Madeline heard the buzz of the car. Link appeared, driving up the slope. He made a short, sliding turn and stopped before the porch. Link had tied two long, heavy planks onto the car, one on each side, and in every available space he had strapped extra tires. A huge casket occupied one open seat, and upon the seat was full of tools and ropes. There was just room in this rear part of the car for Nels to squeak in. Link put Madeline in front of, beside him, and then bent over the wheel. Madeline waved her hand at the silent cowboys on the porch. Not an audible goodbye was spoken. The car glided out of the yard, leaping from level to slope, and started swiftly down the road out into the open valley. Each stronger rush of dry wind in Madeline's face marked the increase of speed. She took one glance at the winding cattle road, smooth, unobstructed, disappearing in the gray of distance. And she took another at the leather-garbed, leather-helmeted driver beside her, and then she drew the hood of veils over her face and fastened it round her neck so there was no possibility of being blown loose. Harder and stronger pressed the wind till it was like a sheeted lead forcing her back into her seat. There was a ceaseless, intense, rapid vibration under her, Occasionally she felt a long swing, as if she was to be propelled aloft, but no jars disturbed the easy clarity of the car. The buzz, the roar of tires, of heavy bodies in flight, increased to a continuous droning hum. The wind became an unsupportable body moving towards her, crushed her breast to make the task of breathing most difficult. To Madeline, the time seemed to fly with the speed of miles. A moment came when she detected a faint difference in hum, rush, and vibration in the ceasing sweep of invisible weight against her. This difference became marked, 
Link was reducing speed. Then came swift change of all sensation, and she realized the car had slowed to normal travel. Madeline removed her hood and goggles. It was a relief to breathe freely to be able to use her eyes. To her right, not far distance, lay the little town of Chiquala. Sight of it made her remember Stuart in a way strange to her constant thought of him. To the left, inclined the gray valley. The red desert was hidden from view, but the Guadalupe Mountains loomed close to the southwest. Opposite of Chiquala, where the road forked, Link Stevens headed the car straight south and gradually increased speed. Madeline faced another endless gray incline. It was the San Bananidos Valley. The singing of the car, the stinging of the wind warned her to draw the hood securely down over her face again, and then it was as if she was riding at night. The car lurched ahead, settling into that driving speed which wedged Madeline back as if in a vice. Again, the moments went by fleeting as the miles. Seemingly, there was an acceleration of the car till it reached a certain swiftness, a period of time in which it held that pace, and then a diminishing of all motion and sound which contributed to Madeline's acute sensation. Uncovering her face, she saw a link was passing another village. Could it be Benito? She asked Link, and then repeated the question. Sure, he replied. Eighty miles. Link did not this time apologize for the work of his machine. Madeline marked the omission with her first thrill of the ride. Leaning over, she glanced at Link's watch, which he had fastened upon the wheel in front of his eyes. A quarter to ten. Link had indeed made short work of the valley miles. Beyond Bernardo, Link sheared off the road and put the car into a long, low-rising slope. Here the valley appeared to run south, under the dark brows of the Guadalupes. Link was heading southwest. Madeline observed that the grass began to fail. As they climbed the ridge, bare, white, dusty spots they started to appear. There were patches of mesquite, cactus, and a scattering of broken rock. She might have been prepared for what she saw from the ridge top. Beneath them, the desert blazed. Seen from afar, it was striking enough, but now riding down into its red jaws gave Madeline the first affront to her impervious confidence. All about her ranch had been desert. The valleys were desert, but this was different. Here was the red desert. Extending far into Mexico, far into Arizona, and California to the Pacific. She saw a bare, hummocky ridge, down which the car was gliding, bounding, and swaying, and this long slant seemed to merge into a whirl of rock and sand patched by sawtooth stone. The distant Sierra Madres were clearer, bluer, and less smoky and suggestive of mirage that she had ever seen upon them. Madeline's sustained faith upheld her in the face of this appalling obstacle. Then the desert that had rolled its immensity beneath her gradually began to rise, to lose its distant margins, its condensate in its varying lights and shades, at last to hide its yawning depths and looming heights behind red ridges, which were only little steps, little outposts, little landmarks at its gates. The bouncing of the huge car throwing Madeline up direct her attention and fasted upon the way Link Stevens was driving and upon the immediate foreground. Then she discovered he was following an old wagon road. At the foot of that long slope they swung into rougher ground and here Link took to a cautious zigzaggy course. The wagon road disappeared and then presented itself, reappeared. But Link did not always hold to it. He made cuts and detours and crosses, and all the time seeming to get deeper into a maze of low red dunes, of flat canyon beds lined by banks of gravel, of ridges that mounted higher. Yet Link Stevens kept on, never turning back. 
He never headed into a place he could not pass. Up to this point of travel, he had not been compelled to back the car. And Madeline began to realize it was the cowboy's wonderful judgment of ground that made advancement possible. He knew the country. He was never at a loss. After making a choice of direction, he never hesitated. And then at the bottom of Wide Canyon, he'd entered a wash where the wheels just barely turned in dragging sand. The sun beat down white hot and the dust rose and there was not a breath of wind and no sound save the slide of rocks now and then down the weathering slopes and the laboring chugging of the engine. The snail pace, like the sand at the wheels, began to drag at Madeline's faith. Link gave the wheel to Madeline and leapt out he called Nels. When they untied the long planks, they laid them in front of the wheels to pass over. Madeline saw how wise Link's forethought had been. With the aid of those planks, they worked the car through sand and gravel that was otherwise impassable. The canyon widened and opened in space, affording an unobstructed view for miles. The desert sloped in steps and in the morning light when the sun was bright on the mesas and escarpments it was gray drab stone slate pink yellow and dominating a dull red rust there were level ground ahead a windswept floor as hard as rock link rushed the car over this free distance Madeline's ears filled with a droning hum like the sound of a monstrous hungry bee, and with a strange, incessant crackle which she at last guessed to be the spreading of sheets of gravel from under the tires. The giant car attained such a speed that Madeline could only distinguish the colored landmarks of the four, and these faded as the wind stung her eyes. And then Link began to ascend of the first step, a long, sweeping, barren waste with dunes of wonderful violet and hues. And here were well-defined marks of old wagon roads that lately been traversed by cattle. The car climbed steadily, surmounting the height, faced another log bench that had been cleanly smoothed by the desert winds. The sky was an intense light, steely blue that was hard on the eyes, so Madeline veiled her face and did not uncover it till Link had reduced the racing speed. From the summit of the next ridge she saw more red ruins of desert. A deep wash crossed the road causing Link Stevens to turn due south. There was a narrow space along the wash just wide enough for the car. Link seemed oblivious to the fact that the outside wheels were perilously close to the edge. Madeline heard the rattle of loosened gravel and earth sliding into the gully. The wash widened and opened into a sandy flat. Link crossed this and took up on the other side. Rocks impeded the progress of the car, and these had to be rolled out of the way. The shelves of slits, apparently ready to wash down with the slightest weight. The little tributary washes, the boulder-hewn stretches of slope, the narrow spaces allowed no more than a foot for the outside wheels. The spear-pointed cactuses had to be avoided. All these obstacles were nothing to the cowboy driver. He kept on, and when he came to the road again, he made up for the lost time by speed. Another height was achieved, and here Madeline fancied that Link had driven the car to the summit of a high pass between two mountain ranges. The western slopes of that pass appeared to be exceedingly rough and broken. Below it spread out into another gray valley, at the extreme end of which glistened a white spot that Link grimly called Douglas. Part of that white spot was Agrula Prienta, the sister town across the line. Madeline looked with eyes that would fain have pierced the intervening distance. The descent of the past began under difficulties. Sharp stones and cactus spikes penetrated the front tires, bursting them open with rip reports. It took time to replace them. The planks were called into requisition to cross soft places. 
A jagged point of projected rock had to be broken with a sledgehammer. At length, a huge stone appeared to hinder any further advance. Madeline caught her breath. There was no room to turn the car, but Link Stevens had no intentions of such a thing. He backed the car to a considerable distance, then walked forward. He appeared to be busy around the boulder for a moment, returned down the road at a run. A huge explosion, a cloud of dust, and a rattling of falling fragments told Madeline that her driver had cleared the passage with dynamite. He seemed to have been prepared for every emergency. Madeline looked to see what effect the discovery of Link carrying dynamite had upon the silent Nels. Well, now, Miss Majesty, there's nothing going to be stopping Link, said Nels with a reassuring smile. The significance of the incident had not dawned upon Nels, or else he was heedless to it. After all, he was afraid of only the car and Link, and fear was an idiocracy. Madeline began to see her cowboy driver with clearer eyes, and his spirit awoke something in her that made danger of no moment. Nels, likewise, subtly responded, and though he was grey-faced and tight-lipped, his eyes took on the cool, bright gleam of Lynx. Cactus barred the way, rocks barred the way, gullies barred the way, and these Nels addressed in the grim humour with which he was wanting to view tragic things. A mistake on Lynx's part, a slip of wheel, a bursting of a tire at a critical moment, an instant of bad luck, which might happen a hundred times on a less perilous ride. Any one of these might spell disaster for the car, and even perhaps death to the occupants. Again and again Link used the planks to cross washes and sand. Sometimes the wheels ran all the lengths of the planks, and sometimes slipped off. Presently Link came to a ditch, where water had worn deep into the road. Without hesitation, he placed them, measured distance carefully, and then started across. The danger was in ditching the machine. One of the planks split and sagged a little, but Link made the crossing without a slip. The road led round an underhanging cliff and was a narrow, rocky, and slightly downhill. Bidding Madeline and Nels to walk around this hazardous corner, Link drove the car. Madeline expected to hear it crash down into the canyon, but presently she saw Link waiting to take them aboard again. Then came steeper parts of the road, places that Link would run down if he had space below to control the car. On the other hand, places where the little inclines ended in abrupt ledges upon one side or declivity upon the other. Here the cowboy with ropes on the wheels and half hitches upon the spurs of rock let the car slide down slowly. Once, in a particular bad spot, Madeline exclaimed involuntary, Oh, time is flying. Link Stevens looked up at her as if he was being reproved for his care. His eyes shone like glints of steel on ice. Perhaps that utterance of Madeline's was needed to liberate his recklessness to his utmost. Certainly he put the car to seemingly impossible feats. He rimmed gullies, he hurtled rising grounds, he leapt little breaks in the even road. He made his machine cling like a goat to steep inclines. He rounded corners with the inside wheels higher than the outside. He crossed weak places. He kept on and on, treading torturous patches through rock, through in patches, keeping to the old road when it was clear, abandoning it for more open spaces and always going down. At length, a mile of clean, brown slope, ridged and grooved like a washboard, led gently down to meet the floor of the valley, where the scant gamma grass struggled to give a tinge to the gray. The road appeared to become more clearly defined and could be seen strikingly straight across the valley. To Madeline's dismay, that road led down to a deep, narrow wash. It plunged on one side, ascending on the other at a still steeper angle. The crossing would have been laborsome of the horse. For an automobile, it was impassable. Link turned the car to the right along the rim, 
and drove as far along the wash as the ground permitted. The gully widened and deepened all the way. Then he checked the other direction. When he made his turn, Madeline observed the sun was precipitously began its slant westward. It shone upon her face, glaring and wrathful. Link drove back down to the road, crossing it, kept on down the line of the wash. It was a deep cut in red earth, worn straight down by swift water in the rainy season. It narrowed. In some places, it was only five feet wide. Link studied these points, looked up the slope, and to be seeming making deductions. The valley was level now, and there was nothing but little breaks in the rim of the, of the wash. Link drove mile after mile, looking for a place to cross, but there was none. Finally, progression to the south was obstructed by an impassable gully where the wash plunged into the head of a canyon. It was necessary to back the car distance there before there was room to turn. Madeline looked at the driver. His face revealed no more the same old hard, immutable character. When he reached the narrowest points, which had some interest in him, he got out of the car and walked from place to place. Once with a little jump, he cleared the wash. And then Madeline noted that the further rim was somewhat lower. In a flash, she divined Link's intention. He was hunting a place to jump the car over the crack in the ground. Soon he found one that suited him, for he tied his red scarf upon the greasewood tree. And then, returning to the car, he clambered in, muttering, and broke his long silence. This ain't no airship, but I've outfigured that damn wash. He backed up the gentle slope and halted just short of steeper ground. His red scarf waving in the wind, hunched low over the wheel, he started slowly at first, and then faster, and then faster. The great car gave a spring like a huge tiger. The impact of the suddenly formed wind had almost tore Madeline out of her seat. She felt Nell's powerful hands upon her shoulders, and she closed her eyes. The jolting headway of the car gave place to a gliding rush. This was broken by a slight jar, and then above the hum and roar rose a cowboy yell. Madeline waited with strained nerves for the expected crash. It did not come. Opening her eyes, she saw the level valley floor without a break. She had not even noticed the instant when the car had shot over the wash. A strange breathlessness attacked her, and she attributed it to the clarity in which she was being carried upon. Pulling the hood down over her face, she sank low in the seat. The whirl of the car now seemed to be a world filled with sounds. Again, the feeling of excitement, the height of emotions, the ever-pressing, impendent sense of catastrophe became held in the sheer immensity of physical sensation. There came a time when all of her strength seemed to unite in an effort to lift her breast against the terrific force of the wind, to draw air into her flattened lungs. She became partly dazed. The darkness before her eyes was not at all by occasion by the blood that was pressed like a stone mask upon her face. She had a sense that she was floating and sailing and drifting, reeling, even while being borne swiftly upon a thunderbolt. Her hands and arms were movable under the weight of the mountains. There was a long, blank period from which she awoke to feel an arm supporting her. So she rallied herself around. The velocity of the car had been cut to the speed to which she was accustomed. Throwing back the hood, she breathed freely again and recovered. The car was bowling along a wide road upon the outskirts of a city. Madeline asked what the place was. Douglas, replied Link, and just around is Aguila Pienta. That last name seemed to stun Madeline. She heard no more and saw little until the car was stopped. Nels spoke to someone, and then sight of khaki-clad soldiers quickened Madeline's faculties. She was on the boundary line between the United States and Mexico and Aguila Pienta, 
with its white and blue walled houses, its brown tiled roofs they lay before her. A soldier, evidently dispatched by Nell's return, and said an officer would come at once. Madeline's attention was centered in the foreground, upon the guard over the road, upon the dry, dusty town beyond, but she was aware of noise and people in the rear. A cavalry officer approached the rear, staring, and removed his sombrero. Can you tell me anything about Stuart, the American cowboy who was captured by rebels a few days ago? asked Madeline. Yes, replied the officer. There was a skirmish over the line between the company of Federals and a large force of guerrillas and rebels. The Federals were driven west along the line. Stuart is reported to have done reckless fighting and was captured. He got a Mexican sentence. He is known here along the border, and the news of his capture stirred up excitement. We did all we could to get his release. The guerrillas they feared, and they were on to execute him, believing he might be able to aid to escape. So a detachment departed with him to Manzuela. He was sentenced to be shot Thursday at sunset tonight? Yep. It was reported there was a personal resentment against Stuart. I regret that I can't give you definite information. If you're friends of Stuart, or relatives I might find... I'm his wife, interrupted Madeline. Will you please read these? She handed him the telegrams. Advise me. Help me if you can. With a wondering glance at her, the officer received the telegrams. He read several, and whistled low in amazement. His manner became quick, alert, and serious. I can't read these written in Spanish, but I know the names that signed them. Swiftly, he ran through the others. Why, this means Stuart release has been authorized. They explain these mysterious rumors we've been hearing here. That grease or treachery. For some strange reason, messages from the rebel Guanta have failed to reach their destination. We've heard reports of an exchange for Stuart, but nothing came of it. No one departed from Mansquella with authority. What an outrage! Come on, I'll go with you to General Sazar, the rebel chief in command. I know him, perhaps we can find something out. Nels made room for the officer. Link sent the car whirling across the line into Mexican territory. Madeline's sensibilities were now alive. The white road led into Agualapienta, a town of colored walls and roofs. Goats and pigs and buzzards scattered before the roar of the machine. Native women wearing black mantles peeped through the iron barred windows. Men wearing huge sombreros and cotton shirts and trousers, bright sashes round about their waists and sandals stood motionless, watching the car go by. The road ended in a plaza, in the center of which was a circular structure that in some measure resembled a corral. It was a bull ring, which was the national sport that was bullfighting being carried on. Just now it appeared to be quarters for a considerable army. Ragged, unkempt rebels were everywhere, and the whole square was littered with tents and packs, wagons, and arms. There were horses, mules, and bureaus, and donkeys, and oxen. The place was so crowded that Link was compelled to drive slowly up to the entrance of the bullring. Madeline caught a glimpse of tents inside, then her view was obstructed by a curious pressing throng. The cavalry officer leapt from the car and pushed his way into the entrance. Link, do you know the road to this mask, fella? asked Madeline. Yeah, I've been there. How far is it? It's not very far, he mumbled. Link, how many miles? I reckon only a few. Madeline knew that he lied. She asked him no more, nor looked at him, nor at Nell's. How stifling was this crowded, ill-smelling plaza. The sun, red and lowering, had sloped far down into the west and still burned with furnace heat. A swarm of flies whirled over the car. 
The shadows of low sailing buzzards crossed Madeline's sight, and then she saw a row of huge, uncanny blackbirds sitting upon a tiled roof. They had neither an air of sleeping nor resting. They were waiting. She fought off a horrible, ghastly idea before its full re realization. These rebels and gorillas, what lean and yellow bearded wrenches, they curiously watched Link as he worked over the car. No two were alike, and they were all haggard. They had glittering eyes that sunk deep in their heads. They were excited and jabbering, adjustable mob. Madeline shuddered to think how a frenzy to spill blood could run through these poor revolutionists. If it was liberty they sought for, they did not show the intelligence in their face. They were like wolves upon a scent. They affronted her and shocked her. She wondered if their officers were men of the same class. What struck her at last and stirred pity in her was the fact that every man of the horde, her swift glance roamed over, however dirty or bed he was, wore upon him some ornaments, some tassel or fringe or lace, some ensign, some hand or bracelet, badge or belt, some twist of scarf, something that betrayed the vanity which was the poor jewel of their souls. It was in the race. Suddenly, the crowd parted to let the cavalry officer and a rebel of striking presence get to the car. Madeline, it's as I suspected, said the officer quickly. The messages directing Stuart's release never reached Selzar. They were intercepted. But even without them, we might have secured Stuart's exchange if it had not been for the fact that one of his captors wanted him shot. This gorilla intercepted the messages and then was instrumental in taking Stuart to Mansquell. It is exceedingly sad why he should be a free man this instant. I regret. Who did this? cried Madeline, cold and sick. Who's the gorilla? Senor Don Carlos. He's been a bandit, a man of influence in Sonora. He is more of a secret agent in the affairs of the revolution than an active participant, but he's been seen doing guerrilla service. Don Carlos, Stuart and his power. Madeline sank down, almost overcome. Then two great hands, powerful, thrilling, clasped her shoulders and knells bent over her. Miss Majesty, we're wasting time here. His voice, like his hands, were uplifting. She wheeled to him with eyes that trembled. How cold, bright, and blue the flash of his eyes. They spoke to Madeline that she must not weaken. But she could not speak her thoughts to Nels and could only look to Link. You figure it's impossible, but I'll, I'll do it said Link Stevens in an answer to the, her voiceless query. The grim, cold, wild something about her and cowboys whitened Madeline's face, steeled her nerve and called to the depths of her for this last supreme courage of a woman. The spirit of the moment was nature with Link and Nell's. For her, it must be passion. Can I get a permit to go into the interior? asked Madeline to the officer. You're going on? Ma'am, it's a forlong hope. Mansquell is a hundred miles away, but there's a chance, the barest a chance, if your man can drive that car. The Mexicans are either murderous or ceremonious in their executions. The arrangements for Stuart's will be elaborate, but barring an unusual circumstance, it will take place precisely at the hour designated you need no permit. Your messages are official papers. But to save time, perhaps delay, I suggest you take this Mexican, Senor Montes, with you. He outranks Don Carlos and knows the captain of the Mensquell detachment. Ah, then this Don Carlo is not in command of the forces holding Stuart? No. I thank you, sir. I'll not forget your kindness. She bowed to Signor Monts and requested him to enter the car. Nels stowed some of the paraphernalia away, making room in the rear of the car. Link 
bent over the wheel. The start was so sudden, with such a crack and roar that the crowd split in a wild disorder, and out of the plaza the car flew, heading headway on. Down a street lined by white and blue walls across a square where rebels were building barricades, along a railroad track full of iron flat cars that carried mounts of piece of artillery through the outlying guards who waved the officer Mons. Madeline bound her glasses tight over her eyes and wound veils throughout the lower parts of her face. She was in a strange glow. She was beginning to burn, to throb, to thrill, to expand, and she meant to see all that was possible. The sullen sun, red as fire, hung over the mountain range to the west. How low it had sunken. Before her stretched a narrow white road, dusty, hard as stone, a highway that had been used for centuries. If it had been wide enough to permit the passing of vehicles, it would have made a magnificent course for automobiles. But the weeds, the dusty flowers, and the mesquite boughs and arms of cactus brushed the cars that sped by. Faster, faster, faster. That old resilient weight began to press Madeline back. The old instant bellow of wind filled in her ears. Link Stevens hunched low over the wheel. His eyes were hidden under leather helmet and goggles, but the lower part of his face was unprotected. He resembled a demon, so dark and hard-stoned and strangely grinning as he was. All at once, Madeline realized how matchless, how wonderful a driver was this cowboy. She divined that weakening could not have been possible to Link Stevens. He was a cowboy, and he really was riding that car making it answer to his will as if he had been born to it. He had never driven to suit himself, had never reached an all-satisfying speed until now. Beyond that, his motive was to save Stuart, to make Madeline happy. Life was nothing to him. That fact gave him the superhuman nerve to face the peril of this ride. Because of his disregard of self, he was able to operate the machine to choose the power, the speed, the guidance, the going with the best judgment and highest efficiency possible. Madeline knew he would get her to Mansquell in time to save Stuart, or he would kill her in the attempt. The white, narrow road flashed out of the foreground, slipping by with rapidity. When she marked a clump of cactus far ahead, it seemed to shoot towards her, to speed behind her even the instant she noticed it. Nevertheless, Madeline knew Link was not putting the car to its limit. Swiftly as he was flying, he held something in reserve. But he took the turns of the road as if he knew the way was cleared before him. He was trusting to cowboy's luck. A wagon in one of those curves, a herd of cattle, even a frightened steer, meant a wreck. Madeline never closed her eyes in these fateful moments. If Link could stake himself and the others and her upon such a chance, what could she not stake her own motive as well? So while the great car hummed and thumbed and darted round the curves on two wheels and sped on like a bullet, Madeline lived that ride, meant to feel it to the utmost. But it was not all swift going. A stretch of softer ground delayed Link, making the car labor pant and pound and grind through the gravel. Moreover, the cactus plants an assumed and alarming ability to impede progress. Long, slender arms of octillo encroached into the road. Broad, round leaves did likewise. Fluted columns, fallen like timbers in a forest, lay along the narrow margins. The bannet cactus, the bensonetti lean threatening, Clusters of magni shadowed by the huge looming cigarro infringing upon the highway to Mansquella. And every leaf, blade, and branch of cactus bore wicked thorns, any one of which would be fatal to a tire. It came at length, the bursting report. The car lurched and went on like a crippled thing and halted, obedient to the master hand at the wheel. Swift as Link was in replacing the tire, he lost time. 
the red sun more sullen, duskier as it neared the black, bold horizon, appeared to mock Madeline, to eye her derisively. Link leapt in, and the car sprang forward. The roadbed changed, and the trees changed. All the surroundings changed except the cactus. There were miles of rolling ridges, rough and hollows, and short rocky bits of road, and washes to cross, and a low, sandy swale where mesquites grouped in the forest, along a trickling, inch-deep sheet of water. Green things softened the hard, dry aspect of the desert. There were birds and parrots and deer and wild boars. All these Madeline remarked with clear eyes, with remarkable stability of attention. But what she strained to see, what she yearned for, or prayed for, was straight, unobstructed road. But the road began to wind up. It turned and twisted in a tantalizing, lazy curves. It was in no hurry to surmount a hill that began to assume proportions of a mountain. It was leisurely, as were all things in Mexico except strife. That was quick, fierce, and bloody. It was Spanish. The descent from that elevation was difficult, extremely hazardous, yet Link Stevens drove fast. At the base of the hill, rocks and sand all but halted him for good. And then, in taking an abrupt curve, a grasping spear ruined yet another tire. This time the car rasped across the road into the cactus, bursting the second front wheel tire. Like demons indeed, Link and Nels worked, shuddering. Madeline felt the declining heat of the sun, saw with gloomy eyes the shading of the red light over the desert. She did not look back to see how near the sun was to the horizon. She wanted to ask Nels, strange as anything on this terrible ride was the absence of speech. As yet, no word had been spoken. Madeline wanted to shriek to Link to hurry, but he was more than humanly swift in all of his actions, so with mute lips, with the fire in her beginning to chill, and with a lifelessness menacing her spirit, she watched and hoped against hope, prayed for a long, straight, smooth road. Quite suddenly, she saw it, seemingly miles of clear, narrow lane, disappearing like a thin white streak into the distant green. Perhaps Link Stevens' heart leapt like Madeline's. The huge car, with a roar and a jerk, seemed to answer Madeline's call, a cry no point, being silent. Faster and faster and faster, the roar became a whining hum. And then for Madeline's sound ceased to be anything she could not hear. The wind was now heavy, no longer a swift plastic -y thing, but solid like an onrushing wall. It bore down upon Madeline with such a weight that she could not move. The green of the desert plants along the road merged into two shapeless fences, sliding at her from the distance. Objects ahead began to blur the white road, to grow streaky like rays of light, the sky to take on more of reddening haze. Madeline realized her sight was failing her, turned for one more look at Link Stevens. It had come to his ride almost as much as it was to her. He hunched lower than ever, rigid, strained to the last degree, a driver. This was his hour, and he was great. If he so much as brushed a flying tire against one of the millions of spikes that, that stuck out, striking out from the cactus, there would be a shock, a splitting of air, and an end. Madeline thought she saw that Link's bulging cheeks and jaw were gray, that his tight shut lips were white, and that the smile was gone, and then he was human, not a demon. She felt a strange sense of brotherhood. He understood a woman's soul as Monty Price had understood it. Link was the lightning-forged automation, the driving, relentless instrument of a woman's will. He was a man whose force was directed by a woman's passion. He reached up to her height and felt her love, understood the nature of her agony, and these made him heroic. But it was the hard life 
the wild years of danger in the desert, the companionship of ruthless men, the elemental that possessed his physical achievement. Madeline loved his spirit then and gloried in the man. She had pictured upon her heart, never to be forgotten, this little hunched, deformed figure of Lynx hanging on with dauntless with a grip that was deathless over the wheel, his gray face like a marble mask. That was Madeline's last clear sensation upon the ride. Blinded, dazed, she succumbed to the demands upon her strength. She reeled, fell back, only vaguely aware of a helping hand. Confusion seized her senses. All about her was dark chaos through which she was rushing, rushing and rushing upon the wrathful red eye of the setting sun. Then, as there was no more sound or sight from her, she felt there was no color. But the rush never slackened. A rush through opaque and limitless space. For hours, moments, ages, she was propelled with the velocity of a shooting star. The earth seemed a huge automobile, and it sped with her down an endless white track through the universe. Looming ghostly, spectral forms of cacti plants large as pine trees stabbed her with giant spikes. She became an unstable being in a shapeless, colorless, soundless cosmos of unrelated things, but all rushing, even to meet the darkness that haunted her and never reached her. But at the end of infinite time, that rush ceased. Madeline lost the queer feeling of being unembodied by a frightful swift careening through boundless distance. She distinguished voices low at first, apparently far away. Then she opened her eyes to blurred but conscious sight. The car had come to a stop. Link was laying face down over the wheel. Nels was rubbing her hands, calling to her. She saw a house, with clean, whitewashed wall and brown-tiled roof. Beyond, over a dark mountain range, peeped the last red curve, the last beautiful ray of the setting sun. End of chapter 24